Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'll get us started here today. Um, welcome everybody for those that are watching us live on uh, YouTube or joining us here in the Zoom. We're very excited for the next installment in our series, First Fridays in OT Research. Um, the whole purpose and of First Fridays for OT Research uh, is to have discussions about what it looks like to be a researcher. How does one get involved in research? What are those different paths? And answer some of those questions that people may have related to research, research careers, um, how research applies to occupational therapy and rehabilitation. And uh, my name is Catherine Hoyt. I am in the research division here at Washington University and uh, co-host this conversation with Dr. Kelly Harris. And I'll hand it over to you. Can you guys hear Kelly? Kelly, I can't hear you. It doesn't look like you're muted, but I, I'm not hearing you. Is that better? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I just was saying, hi, I'm Kelly Harris, also in the research division at um, And I think um, we'll jump right into our topic. It's a little hard to hear you, Kelly. I don't know if other people are experiencing that. It's kind of like sometimes I hear you at um, like the right level and sometimes it's a little quiet. And sometimes okay, is that any better? Oh yeah, that's a lot better. Okay, excellent. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> um, so I was just going to get into introducing our topic. Uh, for today. So today we're talking about navigating the application process. So what are the things to consider? What are, you know, kind of those underlying questions? And we have Dr. Carrie Morgan here to join us for this discussion. Um, do you want to um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of a brief bio, Dr. Morgan? Sure. Thank you guys for having me. Excited to be part of the talk this week. Um, so I am Carrie Morgan. I'm an assistant professor in occupational therapy and neurology at Washington University. Um, I am an OT that worked for a bit, um, did a little bit of clinical um, work, um, and then really got interested in research. I worked in a research lab for a while and decided to return back to school for my PhD. Um, and I'm now on faculty at WashU um, and, uh, mostly doing research and my research focuses on people with disabilities. Um, I do a lot of community-based research. I'm really interested in physical activity and exercise. So for folks that are leaving rehabilitation facilities, for example, folks with spinal cord injuries, um, what can we do, um, or how can we understand the barriers and supports that are needed, uh, and get the right interventions in place for people, um, transitioning in the, in the community to make sure that they have opportunities to do physical activity and exercise. Um, so that is what my work, my main line of work focuses on. Um, and I've been on the research track as an assistant professor for the last four years. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie. We're um, excited to have you today. Um, so I think, should we jump right into our first question? Catherine, do you have anything you want to add? I don't think so. We're just hoping to have an informal conversation today. So I have it pulled up on YouTube. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to drop them there here in the chat on Zoom. Um, and previous videos are up there if you need them. Let's hop right in. Awesome. All right. Well, we wanted to start with just um, kind of a, a, a broad, you know, what is the typical, um, what is typically part of that application and application process to a PhD program? What does that look like? What does the timeline look like? Yeah, so I can start, and um, Kelly, I know you know a lot of this as well, so feel free to sort of back me up, and Catherine, I know you're catching up with the process too, so if I'm missing things, um, please feel free to jump in, but um, I think the other thing I should have said that I've been involved in the um, review process of PhD applicants for the um, RAPS program, the Rehabilitation and Participation Science program for the last four cycles, I believe, um, so I'll just sort of speak to what our application process looks like. And I can also speak to sort of from a reviewer's perspective, some of the things that we look at when we're reviewing applications. 
Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know if there's a lot of technical questions. Um, really, Abby King is the person to go to, um, but I can talk sort of just about general procedural stuff. Um, so for an application um, to a PhD program, you're looking at some basic things. So first would be there's a basic ac application form that you have to complete. Um, so there's one for Washington University um, that's specific to our program. So making sure you have the form completed and completed properly. Um, there's also an application fee. I believe it's somewhere, um, I think it's $45 application fee to submit your application. Um, there's an essay required for our application for our PhD program. Uh, and the essay is all about why you're choosing um, to come to the RAPS program. Um, and what prepares you for a scientific career. Um, it's also um, uh, addressing sort of your motivation for studying, um, specifically participation in rehabilitation science. Um, and, you know, in these essays, you probably want to touch on any prior experience that you've had related to research, um, whether it's clinical or working in a research lab, um, and potentially talking about your area of interest and some of your goals. Um, the other thing that is required is some sort of um, writing sample. So if you've been an author on a paper or you have something um, from your college or graduate studies, um, some sort of research paper that you had to write, um, there is a scholarly writing requirement where you're sending in an example. Um, you also have to send in transcripts, um, official transcripts of your um, graduate academic work. Um, you have to um, submit three letters of recommendations describing um, your abilities um, for uh, PhD studies. And we, we can talk about those recommendations a little bit more and sort of what reviewers might be looking at. Um, and then for um, anyone that's applying um, that's an international candidate, um, there's, there's a few extra requirements. Um, and one of them is um, getting the transcripts checked through an agency. Um, and this is where really Abby King can uh, sort of help out. And then the second requirement is for folks that are applying from international studies where English is not the first language. Um, there is um, English testing requirements that have to happen within 12 months of the application process. And so um, typically the timeline um, is for our RAPS program, the application process opens is open from September 1st through December 15th. Um, and then we typically, um, for candidates that we select for interviews, we will interview candidates early in the year. So typically around uh, January or February um, of the following year, if that makes sense. Um, so that's just some, some general logistics of sort of core requirements as well as um, a general timeline. And then we typically, for our program, let students know um, about acceptance um, early spring. Um, so, so sort of March um, timeline-ish, give or take a little bit. Um, so that's kind of general stuff. I think Catherine, I saw something in the chat where you might have some additional information to share. Yeah, thank you for that summary, Carrie. I just wanted to add a follow-up question perhaps for you and for Kelly. Do you think that having a publication is necessary? I know lots of people might be interested in pursuing a research degree, but might not have that prior research experience. Um, do you have any comments about that and then um, yeah. about needing that? And then, yeah, I guess let's just start with that. Yeah, so I think there's some key things as a reviewer that I'm looking for. So, and I think you can do it in a lot of different ways. So I, I don't think to apply for our PhD program, you have to be an author on a paper. If you're not an author on a paper, somewhere in your essay or somewhere on your transcript or maybe both, there be, should be some key points that indicate that you have some level of experience in research. Um, and, and really what we're trying to get at is, is, is research is a different thing. And we wanna make sure that people have insights and perspectives of what it's gonna look like to be a professional researcher and that that's what you wanna do because it's a big commitment to, get into a, to go through a PhD program. And if that's, 
we, we want to make sure that people really have insights to what that looks like and they know what they're getting into. Um, and then the writing requirement, I mean, is great if it's a published article, but we, you know, a big skill for a PhD is writing. So what we're looking, looking for in the writing sample is that the person has um, the ability to write in, in a um, scholarly academic way. And so, um, so again, it doesn't have to be a published article to get that done. It could be a writing sample from graduate school very easily. Um, but, but if somebody does that, then I'm gonna be looking somewhere else in their transcript, whether it's a recommendation from a lab that they worked in, um, from their supervisor, or it's um, something on their transcript where they took a research assistant elective, or, or I'm gonna be looking for something to make sure that there's some sort of research experience along the way. Um, does that sort of make sense? Yeah, and I know you, you asked us both, Catherine, so I would just kind of um, echo much of what Carrie said, and I'll say from my own experience, so my PhD is in education, actually not in um, in RAPS, and I, um, and so that program, I think, you know, the process is very similar, right, and I think um, perhaps Maybe internally there's differences, but I think overall the process is similar. I didn't have a publication when I applied, but I did. I had done, um, I was a research assistant twice for two different professors, both of whom wrote me letters, which I think was really helpful. And I um, was like a co-author on a, a presentation for a conference, but for the writing sample, I had done you know scholarly writing that I just had not submitted for publication um, in those experiences. And so that's what I submitted. Um, and so I think, I mean, there is that requirement kind of across the board, right, for our RAPS program, but then for most programs, I don't think I've seen a PhD program that doesn't ask for some kind of writing sample, um, but I don't think it has to be a publication. I think, um, I, I guess I can't speak for other fields than the two that I have that experience with, but um, yeah, so I would agree with what Carrie said. Um, I, I have a, well, did you want to add, Catherine, before? going to jump to follow up. Oh, go for it. I know you have another follow-up. Well, I think, you know, Carrie, you were talking about the essay and I, um, so, you know, you highlighted the importance of talking about that research experience in your essay. I'm wondering if as a reviewer, you want to see, um, you, like what kind of knowledge of the program specifically you want to see and then knowledge of perhaps people in the department or um, should that essay kind of informally or indirectly speak to particular people in the program. That was some advice that I got when I was applying is that, you know, you might not need to kind of call folks out, but you really need to clearly be talking to the faculty in that program and faculty you're interested in working with. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's great, Kelly. And absolutely. So I would say, um, uh, whether this is a tip or whatever you want to call it, um, if you're applying to a PhD program, that you're making sure that it's the right fit for you. And the way that you make sure it's the right fit is that you're talking to people um, and uh, you're applying to the program, but you're also basically applying to work with somebody in that program. So if you haven't spoken with them and you don't reflect that somehow in your application, so I, I think a really good time to talk about it is in your interview process. But I think there is, like Kelly, you're alluding to, a really good opportunity in your essay to paint a picture of why you think you're going to be a good fit for our program and, and why you're coming here. And a lot of that is probably because you want to work in somebody's lab or gain a certain skill. Um, so, so when I'm looking at the essay, I'm making sure, okay, is rehabilitation and participation science the best fit? So somehow you need to sort of convince me that your work or your interest area fits in there. And then I'm going to be looking at, okay, this is what your interest area is. Do we have anybody in this program to support that? And so if you can call that out in your essay, because you already know it, then that answers that for me. So, um, so I do think the essay is a really good opportunity, not to, just to talk about your past experience, and which is really important, but also to talk about why you're coming here, why it's a good fit, and what your work is, and, 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 and that you really feel like it's going to be supported and why. I think that's a really good point. And why you were saying that, it made me think about how the three of us have PhDs, but they're actually all in different things, in different fields. And we're all working in occupational therapy. 
Carrie, I know your PhD is in movement science and Kelly, you just mentioned yours is in education and mine, I got through the OT program, but it can all lead to a different point. And I think that really speaks to the importance of identifying that mentor that aligns with your research and maybe not even necessarily the program or the program title. Um, I, don't, I don't, yeah, I guess that's more of a statement. If, you, if anybody else has anything to add to that or I can move on to the next question. I would just uh, you also sort of add, you know, being an independent investigator, um, you have to do this your whole entire career, which is to make sure that you have a team around you and mentors around you. So this is your first um, experience doing that, right? Making sure that you're identifying a lab and a mentor that's going to help support you. Now, not to say that we've had some folks come through the program and get in the program and they identify one mentor. Um, and then they realize um, for whatever it might be that maybe another mentor um, in the program might be better. So there's flexibility and there's some things. So I don't want people to feel like they're locked into certain things. However, I, I think the important thing here is just um, if when you're applying, showing that you're having conversations with the program and that you know what's going on there and that you know that your interest areas can be supported there. And from an application process, that, that's a uh, review process that's really important because um, we, we want to make sure that we're able to support you properly. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Um, so I think, you know, while we're talking about kind of these kind of tips, I'm wondering about other tips or recommendations in general and specific maybe to recommendation letters um, for applicants. Like what should we, you know, applicants think about when they're trying to identify people to write for them? Um, who are we looking to see letters from or who are reviewers looking to see um, letters from? Yeah. Any other tip? Yeah. So for recommendation letters, um, you know, I, I think my, my, my tips here would be to, to think about you know, it'd be great if you had one letter, at least one letter where somebody could talk about um, your research skills or your research experience or something that you've done that's research related. Um, and then, you know, it would be great. Maybe it's in that letter, maybe it's somewhere else, but that someone could speak um, to your qualities just generally as a person and maybe somebody who could speak um, to your qualities and your academic achievements and your academic success. So when you're thinking about this, you know, maybe it's a, um, a professor from your graduate education, um, from your OT education or um, uh, from uh, other graduate education, but somebody that knows you academically. Um, and then maybe if you worked in somebody's research lab, maybe it, it's theirs, maybe, you know, that maybe it's your supervisor writing um, the recommendation letter. Uh, potentially you could be out of school for a while. This was me and applying for a PhD. So I took many, many, many years off before I returned. Um, so, you know, then possibly you're looking at, if you're looking, working in a clinical environment, um, your supervisor there, or, um, you know, did you have any access to doing research when you, you were in your clinical site? Maybe that co person could speak for you. So, um, I think you're strategically thinking about three people that can sort of address, um, again, I'm, I'm sort of looking at just qualities of the person and, and, and just generally, and then academic su success qualities and then research experience. So sort of selecting people that can address those um, uh, is, and obviously you wanna select people that you've um, think know you well and think that you've had good experiences with. So they're talking positively about you and your recommendations. Yeah, I think that's great. I want to just maybe add to that a little bit and say, um, cause I, I, I love that you brought up having been out of school for a while. Um, that was my situation as well. And because I had these research experiences, I could kind of go back to folks who had mentored me during those experiences and ask for letters. But I think for folks who are really like thinking about, man, I don't know if this is for me, but I'm getting some research experience now. Maintaining those relationships are really, it's really important so that you have someone to ask for those letters. Um, and so thinking about, you know, just checking in periodically and letting them know, you know, what you're doing and where you are, just so that you're staying at the front of some, you know, someone's mind and not so that when you do write to ask for that letter, it's not like, who, who are you? 
<laughs> when did we work together? How long ago was it? Like thinking about it like that. So just kind of maintaining touch just in case if you're on the fence or still thinking about it. Um, I thought that was great. Um, hey, Kelly, I just add one more thing to sort of what you're saying. I think the other thing that I look at is making sure that in those letters that it's like it's people, I, I, again, I think you can have a mix here, but somewhere in there, it's somebody that's known you for quite a bit. It's not somebody just that knew you for a one month. I, I think if, if you did a one month research experience and that one person is going to write, then you need to find somebody else that's known you for a little bit longer um, that can speak to you from, from a little bit longer period of time. So just making sure that you're having a mix um, in there of perspectives and people that uh, maybe they haven't known you quite a lo- as long, but now you're going to put in a recommendation from somebody that knew you um, for a little bit longer. That's a great point. And I think both both of you have brought up some really interesting perspectives on how we can create a comprehensive application and thinking about it as a whole package rather than necessarily like individual parts. Um, and that it's important to tie in all of those different pieces of who you are and your interests and your experience with research. Um, something that I've noticed, and you know, even for for lots of people that may be listening in, that they might think that research might be a good path for them or have interest in doing that, but not actually have too much research experience yet. Do do either of you have any recommendations or ideas um, for students? who are interested in a research career, but haven't yet uh, had much experience. Yeah, so I think I think this can go a couple of ways. I could think it could be for students, but I also think it could be for clinicians that get out and they realize, wow, research is really important part of our profession. <laughs> and in order to be a good clinician, you need good research and maybe they wanna switch. Um, so I, you know, I think it depends where you are, but it, let's just, start with talking if you're a current student or you're a student that's going to go into a a OT program or a related field. Um, I think it's, um, if you have any interest at all, I think it's identifying in your program what opportunities are there. Um, So I can give, I know WashU obviously the best, so I can give some examples, but um, you know, if you come in as a uh, occupational therapy doctorate student at WashU, so an OTD student, um, you have a, a six credit hours where you get OT mentored um, scholarship experience. It's required to graduate from the OTD program. So if you are in this, if you're in OTD um, and you're thinking about doing research, I would try to identify a lab for your placement that has an independent investigator doing funded research where you can get exposure um, to that research. So so being um, selective in where you're trying to get to meet that requirement. If you already know straight off um, going into OT school that you wanna be a researcher, and we've had a few of those students come through the WashU program, we sort of guide them and maybe if that's what you know is maybe you don't necessarily need an OTD. It sort of depends that this is individual stuff, but you know, potentially um, in our master's program, there's a uh, master's scholarship elective where you can get four credit hours. It might be six, don't quote me on this, um, but it's several credit hours where you can identify um, a mentor in a lab that you would like to do those credit hours in and get exposure to research. And again, we sort of um, guide people to select somebody on the research faculty who's a PI who has funded research to do those experiences. So I think those are a few ways you could build it in your curriculum, right? It's sort of what I'm saying to get um, the the, the exposure to research. Um, you know, some programs might not have these opportunities so clean, but, but there might be other opportunities, for example, to be a graduate research assistant. Um, and maybe it's within the OT program. Maybe it's in another OT program. Maybe it's during the summer hour, summer time period where you're um, selecting to um, do um, some volunteer or assistantship hours in a research lab. So I think there's several ways to sort of build it in. Um, I, the first recommendation, like I said, it was look into the curriculum. Is there a natural place to add it? And then I would look, is there any um, internship, volunteer, um, other elective hours or another way that I could address it while I'm a student? Um, and then 
if you're not a student and you've, you're, you're working in a, um, a clinic or as a clinician um, and you're interested in research, the first thing I would say to you is look around your environment. Are you in a place where research is being conducted at all? And could you maybe be part of a clinical research team where you're exposed to it? Maybe it's not your primary role, but that you do have some sort of role, or is there, is there some way to get around it more naturally in your environment? Um, so that would be sort of my other recommendation. Um, so I've known clinicians that know that they want to do it and then sort of took a year off and worked in a lab and then did a PhD. That, that's a little harder sometimes on logistics and finances. So it, it just... Um, it, it, it just sort of depends, I guess, independently on what people's um, current um, uh, resources and exposure is. But those are just some maybe examples. I, I, um, I think that's great. And it's, it's that it's multiple um, examples of that. I, I would just add, like, it never hurts to just ask, even if those opportunities don't formally exist. So for me, like my clinical background is a speech pathologist. And when I was completing my master's, there was no research built in, um, but I had had a previous undergrad research experience that I liked. And so I just went to a professor whose work I was interested in and was like, listen, how do we build an independent study for me that gives me some research experience? And that actually was the writing sample I submitted for my PhD many years later. Um, I had done that with an independent study with this professor um, and I just kind of, you know, cold called or emailed her um, to say, hey, I want to kind of create an opportunity. So I think that a lot of places, you know, if you don't ask, um, you, you can't find it. But if you ask, sometimes people are willing to um, create opportunities where they, they might not appear to already exist. Um, I had a follow up question. So Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just add to that. So Kelly, that's, that's great. And I think, um, so everybody's been down this road, right? So I've been down that road, like trying to get research experience, trying to find mentors. And so when you get on the other side of it, I get really excited when students reach out to me. I, I Part of being a researcher is mentoring. And I really like that part of it. So I wouldn't um, be intimidated or, because I think sometimes students are intimidated by it. Um, I, I, I truly, and, and I see it on our faculty all the time at WashU, like we value mentoring. And so you won't know if it's the right fit um, unless you ask. And so um, I, I think the, that's a great idea. Can I just ask? You never know. I have another thing to add to that a little bit, because I know when I was going through my clinical training, if you asked me, I never would have said that I wanted to pursue a career in research. I didn't see that as my future. I loved being a clinician. Um, but as, you know, as years of practice and my exposure and opportunities came by, I think an another way people can get research experience that you may not be aware of as a clinician is that if there is a, like a research institution or a university or um, a hospital that conducts research, they might be willing to take you on for just a certain percentage of your time, that it may not be a full-time position. I was primarily a clinician, but like 20% of my time or 10% of my time was helping with a research study as a clinician, either conducting an intervention or evaluation assessments that I was familiar with because of my clinical skills. And so you might be able to apply your clinical skills within the context of a research study um, to get some of that exposure, but still be paid. <laughs> That's really excellent. That's an excellent idea. Um, I have, if nobody else says anything about that, I have a question. I, I wanna jump back into the application just a little bit before we kind of start thinking about um, what makes an exceptional application. I'm just curious, you know, for, for folks like for me, I remember applying and thinking like, ooh, I might have, you know, these things that I'm assuming people might see as problems or challenges or concerns, is it important to like be really upfront and address those and kind of, you know, here are things that, that, and not maybe presenting them as a concern to me, but if I have concerns as a prospective PhD student to kind of on the front end show that I've given some thought and, and bringing those things out or what do you think? Yeah. So I think if there's something on your transcript or something that you think uh, would be glaring, <laughs> uh, 
I think to address it in your essay is a smart thing to do. I, um, I, I think the other way that you can do it is if, if you think, um, if, you, you, if you have concerns about different parts of your application, this is also, I think, where just communication and talking, like, so, so reaching out to Abby King, who oversees um, the application process, um, and, and sort of uh, potentially getting her guidance, um, but also if, if it's specific something um, that, that might be appropriate to talk to a research faculty about, about how you might represent that on an application process. But I do, I, I, if there is something that you think is going to stand out, I think, um, I, I, I think if you feel like you can thoroughly address it in a way that the reviewers will understand it and taking that opportunity to do it in an essay might not be a bad idea. Excellent, thanks. I'm gonna pass it to Kathy for the next question. Are there, I, so I think the other things that we'd like to talk about are if there's any, any golden nuggets that you have to share with people who may be listening an hour in the future that make an application truly exceptional, or if there are, um, and then kind of tied to that a little bit, what makes an exceptional application, but also, what are the things that you thought about when you were applying that made you uh, want to apply to a program or things that you considered as you were applying? Boy, that's a lot. <laughs> that was a lot, I'm sorry. Let me, let me think about it. <laughs> so the, the first thing that I would say is make sure you know the program that you're applying to, what they want. So Washington University Program in Occupational Therapy, Rehabilitation and Participation Science Program trains independent investigators, meaning that we're preparing you when you graduate from our program to uh, get your independent funding and primarily be a researcher. So we're, if, if you get in your essay and you start talking about how you want to get a PhD to be a teacher, to be an instructor um, and, and, and teach, we're probably not the best fit for you. Um, not to say that we we don't. There, there's a teaching course and, and we value it. And um, but our research division and our researchers um, are, you know, primarily their main focus is research. And so that's what we're training you for. So that's what you uh, need to address in your application. Is that that's what you're looking for. Um, that you've had this research experience um, in the past and, and you've seen what that looks like and you have this specific area of interest. And when you graduate our program, that's what you want to focus on and you want to bring evidence to the profession um, as an independent investigator. Um, and I would use those words <laughs> um, because those are red flags. Um, you know, when, and, and, and some of the other things we'll start seeing in essays is that people will say, well, I want to work um, 50% as a researcher and 50% as a clinician. And um, again, maybe our program is not the best fit for you at that point, um, because we're really training you to be researchers. That's, and that's what you're going to get. There's not going to be a lot of time to do clinical work, not to say you can't do some here and there and PRN and, but, but that's really not what we're training you for. And so, so anyway, I'm being long winded about this, but what I'm trying to say here is make sure you know what the program is. It, what its purpose is and that you're addressing that that's what you want. Um, so um, I think, you know, what makes a really good application um, is somebody that um, is really thoughtful and, and you can tell that it, it's, it's been well planned, that they've um, had research experience, that they have a interest area that they're passionate about. I think um, that's what, in my opinion, that's what makes a really good researcher is that you're passionate about something. Um, and so what is that for you? Um, and then how is our program going to help you, um, be better, um, and, 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 and be a strong researcher. Um, and so, um, and then, you know, are the recommendations strong? Um, you know, are there three people out there that feel like you, are going to be successful. I, you know, being a PhD student, it's a commitment. It's a different thing. It's a, than anything that you've ever done before, most likely is very different than anything I'd ever done. And I hadn't been a student for a while. 
Um, and that transition back was a lot. And I had to do a lot of thinking about, is this the right thing for me? And so that's what we want to see in the application is, you know, have you done that thinking? Are you ready for this next step? Um, and, um, you know, that you have the academic background behind you to, to do that. So, um, yeah, so I'm not sure there's any magical nuggets here that I can give you, except um, the best applications that I read are just really well thought out and that the person's passion comes across that they want to do this and they've thought about it and they've prepared to put themselves in a good situation and they're excited for the next step. And the next step they truly believe is um, the WashU OT RAPS program. So um, that's great. Thank you. I think, um, so we have, a, I know at least one question. And so we'll jump to that first and then maybe jump back in. Go ahead. You want to unmute and ask your question, Madeline? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Morgan. I'm Madeline Yu. I'm a first year OTD student here. And in our first week of classes and in a lot of programs cross country for OT, they talk about getting off of that sort of A train. And I'm wondering how that relates to students who have an intention to go into a PhD, whether that's right after uh, the clinical degree or further into the future, what the weight of the GPA carries in an application. Yeah, um, so, I, you know, and Kelly, maybe you can um, jump in after because maybe as reviewers, we approach this differently. Um, I definitely, I look at the grades and I'm looking that there's no glaring things and I'm looking at, you know, have they had statistics in the past and what does that grade look like? Do they do any sort of research electives and what did those grades look like? Um, but you know, if somebody had a C back in way back when and something, I, you know, I, I can't say I'm overly concerned about it. If it's a glaring thing and the GPA is pretty low, I'll red flag it, but you know, if it's a pretty solid um, GPA and there's no glaring issues in the past, I'll look for a few key classes that I think might sort of relate to research on the transcript, look at what those grades are. Um, but honestly, where I sort of put a lot of my weight into is experiences, um, interest areas, um, that essay, the recommendation, that's really what I'm looking at. Again, you need to come in with a fairly solid transcript. Um, so don't get me wrong on that, but I don't have a cut point. I'm not looking at, oh, this person has a 3.49. So, ooh, I don't think so. I'm sort of looking at it more holistically, I guess. Um, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think this is where, you know, differences in like perhaps some master's programs and PhDs come in, right? So a great, really strong all A's transcript shows that you know how to do school. That's excellent. And again, I agree with Carrie that like, it's not, um, grades are important. So this is not to say that grades don't matter, but um, I would be, I'm less interested in <clears throat> like, yes, I want you to, you know, I want to know that people know how to do school, but we want to make sure you know how to do research and are going to become an, um, a successful independent investigator. And so, you know, consistency matters, you know, challenges here or there, I don't think are, are big red flags, just like you said, I think, unless, you know, the only challenges are all research related coursework or something like that. But I agree with what Carrie said. I think um, when you get to a PhD program, transcripts are a little bit different. They matter, but your letters and your essay are more important. Um, yeah. I think, I think they get more attention in the review process. That answer it, Madeline? Do you, do you have any other follow-up questions? No, I think that that answered it. It seemed like just based on what you guys were saying earlier that a lot of it is that um, type of experience, the letters of recommendation and essays that are gonna be bigger factors than the quantitative number of your scores. Um, but then I, I guess another question is, I'm not, I know it's different for every program, but what about GRE type of stuff? Um, is that kind of something that's super important? Is it more just kind of like the uh, transcripts where it's like, you look at it briefly, but not as much as those other um, writing samples and things like that. Kelly, are we requiring GRE anymore? I don't, I don't think so. But um, 
I'm not 100% confident on that. Um, I, I don't think we are, but now all of a sudden I'm questioning myself. Um, I, I, I don't remember that in the list of requirements and I don't remember seeing GREs in the last round, but maybe I'm missing something. So this is an Abby question. Um, but I, I, I don't think we're requiring GREs for the RAPS program. Now, some other PhD programs, maybe. Um, it seems like a lot of graduate programs and PhD programs are actually moving away from it. Um, so I, um, again, <laughs> make sure I'm right on that. You know, losing my mind a little bit, but um, I, I don't think we're requiring those right now. I think, you know, that I guess what I would add is I think a reason that a lot of institutions are placing less emphasis on standardized test period, right? So undergrad, graduate, we're kind of seeing that more broadly is that there is an awareness of kind of the inherent um, challenges with judging solely on those kind of um, measures, right? And so I think, so, you know, for example, if, um, if you do have to submit a GRE and, and your GRE scores aren't great, Addressing that somehow, somewhere, you know, is important, right? Because test taking is itself a skill and we're not, um, it, you know, it's, it can be a struggle. Um, and I think that we're, we're definitely aware of that. And so I think that just like a transcript, um, it's, it's not as important. Um, if, it, if you have it, it's not as important as some of those other factors. Would you say that's, that's accurate, Carrie? Yeah, um, yeah. completely accurate. Yeah. I did have another question that was kind of unrelated to application necessarily, but more so thinking about mentorship. And I know that Dr. Morgan had mentioned the importance of reaching out to find a mentor that would support your interests. And I'm wondering if how important it is to have somebody that as a mentor that has work that's directly aligned with what you're doing. And if they don't have it that's directly aligned, is it still worth applying? Um, and how you kind of navigate that sort of situation? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question in itself. So I think what you're looking for is, um, you know, a lab and an environment and a mentor that are going to support your growth. And in a PhD school, you're learning um, skills and you're learning how to be a researcher um, that will help you then when you graduate to take your passion area <laughs> And, and, and have the skills and be able to um, uh, be an independent investigator in your research area, right? So I'm not sure you're ever gonna, um, in, in all situations, you might not be able to find sort of this perfect match of someone that um, is, is exactly your interest area, right? Because your interest area is yours and you're gonna take it a different way. So what you're trying to look for is, um, you know, somebody that's going to, um, be able to somewhere be in your interest area, right? So I have a PhD student right now that's really interested in disability and environment. And in my physical activity and exercise work, we look at the environment, not as a, um, that's not my main motivation, but it's definitely an aspect of it because the environment is very important. Um, but, you know, she's, um, she's interested in disability work. So it may, so, so again, it, it, it's not the perfect fit, but it's a good fit for both of us. Cause she sort of brings in, um, into my research, um, and time we're looking at the data, sort of this lens of the environment and probably things that I wouldn't have been able to have time or the opportunity to do, but I'm able to still support her just in her general, um, research skills, but she's still around the population, um, and I know enough of the area. So, so you, you know, you're, you're, you need to figure out what your area is, what you're trying to learn. Is there a skill set that you're trying to learn? Um, you know, she's very passionate about community-based research. Well, that's what I do. So, um, so, so sort of looking through, okay, what are the things you're trying to get and, and what sort of lab and mentor maybe best aligns with that? Um, and Catherine and Kelly, I don't know if you have any other tips there, but th that is a trick. Um, and, and the other thing I would add is somebody that you think you're going to work with well. Um, so, you know, you probably need to ask things like, how do you mentor and what's your mentor approach? And um, because if, you know, people learn differently and people get motivated differently. And um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm a fairly hands-on mentor, but I definitely don't hold many hands. So if you don't have some self 
um, initiative and motivation, um, you, you, you're probably going to struggle. So, you, you know, uh, but we touch base a lot. We have weekly research lab meetings and then I have a weekly meeting with her and that's how we work. So it, does that align with what works for you? So I think mentorship style um, is a really important aspect as well of sort of picking what environment, um, what research lab environment, what mentor might be the best fit for you. I think that's great. Um, I would say like this, this is a, a topic in and of itself, right? Picking a mentor. Um, and I think it, the only thing I would add, is not really, I think added it, but just a different framing is like, what's the story, right? When somebody looks and says, oh, you work with this person. Is it, you know, with com- complete confusion as to why, or are there clear connections, right? So can you tell a clean story that makes sense for, you know, and, and also do you work well together? I think that that's at the top of the list, but like, yeah, is there a story that connects you? Is there, can you, can people make, connect those dots without, um, you know, full kind of detailed explanation is all I think I would add, which is, I think in essence, what you're saying, Carrie, um, I'm going to wrap up our live stream. And then um, if you have other questions, um, we can certainly ask them. But I think we want to thank everyone for joining us and watching mm-hmm. live. The video will be available for um, viewing later um, as as our other videos. And I would say the other thing that would be great is if um, anyone has you know thoughts or ideas for things they would like us to discuss to um, let us know. That would be great. So anything else you want to add, Catherine? No. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great long uh, holiday weekend.